I am going to crank this up so it's right here. Yep. <coughs> Well, all her friends have got one, and my wife, she wants one too. It's a neatly fuzzy fur coat, and she said that nothing else was going to do. She said she'd look real classy, said she'd make me proud of her if I break down and buy her that fur. Well, she got me to thinking, how was I going to swing that kind of deal? The good Lord knows I can't afford one, and I'm too ashamed to steal. But the problem finally solved itself like a bolt out of the blue. It jumped right out in front of me on Highway 92. <laughs> that big old German shepherd, my truck he did not see. Now he's in doggy heaven, but his hide belongs to me. <laughs> For six weeks in my basement, I worked hard there every night. Well, it was mainly trial and error, but I finally got it right. Well, I put it in a big old cardboard box, and I took it upstairs to her. Oh, my wife, she was tickled plump to death when she saw all that fur. Now she's got her fuzzy fur coat, and it goes way down to her knees. But lately she's been complaining that her claws is full of fleas. Now she don't know that's Fido that's wrapped around her tie. But my wife, she puts on the dog when she goes out at night. Now she's been a little discouraged here lately since I ran over her little kitty cat. <laughs> but I think she'll feel much better when I give her a new fur hat. <laughs> Stuff. All right, I am having a great time. I was glad that I woke up this morning and saw there's actually sunshine in Alaska. It'll be okay, precious. I've been waiting the whole time to say that. All right. Somebody left me a vanilla Coke. Now listen, I, it, it is discouraging to me seeing people from Alaska walk around with Pepsis in their hands. You don't understand that Mormons drink Pepsi. But uh, where I'm from, Southerners, because Coke is made where? Does anybody know? Atlanta, Georgia. So if you, how many of y'all have ever had Coke and, and, and uh, 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 roasted peanuts. You put your peanuts down in the bottom of it. Oh, 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 man. That's delicious. So, and he said he was on the platypi. Does that mean they get extra points? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, one point. That's right. One point. <laughs> well, the other point gets two because they gave me two Coca Colas. So I will enjoy those later. Fantastic. Well, we've got this theme of continue on. And as I was listening to the preaching throughout the week and then listening to preaching this evening, I, uh, <clears throat> I believe this is what the Lord would have me to bring. I've preached this before. I don't know that I've ever preached this in, in uh, it, it, Bible Baptist, but it's what the Lord had laid on my heart, so I'm going to bring it to you tonight. Amen. And that's the difference. If you're going to continue on, you're going to have to make some decisions in your life. Uh, listen, people who continue on are not... Uh, they're not... Uh, winos. They're not uh, uh, people who are just going to uh, be afraid to step out. It's going to take someone that's willing and afraid to step out. Many years ago, I can't remember how many exactly, but there was uh, up in Pennsylvania in a little Amish school uh, on the side of the road in an Amish uh, community in Pennsylvania, a deranged man pulled up to a, to a small one-room school. He walked into the back door of the school and he barred the door shut, had a gun in his hand, and he told all the boys, there was a back door over there, and he told all the boys to leave him with all those young ladies. And one by one, those boys jumped up and ran out the door. And he locked that door, and they left that man to abuse and then murder their sisters, their cousins, their aunt, who was the teacher, they walked away and allowed a man to abuse and then murder the ladies. 
the young lady, the young girl. And I remember when it happened, thinking to myself, where were the men? Yeah. Now, it's easy to say, well, they're just teenagers, you see, Brother Perry. Can I just say something to you? And I don't want to get you into a, a spooked out or scared tonight when I say this. But sometimes, I want you to listen very closely, men, to what I have to say here tonight, because you are men. Can I just say, let me just back up here and uh, get on a little rabbit trough and just say it. Sure. The Bible talks about children, and the Bible talks about men. The Bible doesn't talk about teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yes, sir. I get you. I get you. You're going in between. You're going through stuff. We were going through McDonald's not too awful long ago. A, a, a true story actually happened. I was going through McDonald's. This, this boy on the other end was going through puberty right there in front of me. He was, he, he was on. He had that little headset on. I could just see his face full of acne and everything else. And I'm making fun of all of you. Don't get offended if you got a pimp along your nose right now. Uh, but uh, he, I could just see the, his face as he's talking to me through that drive through, you know. Window. Went, uh, it, what a window did the, uh, the, the speaker? Let me preach. <laughs> he says, Hello, welcome to McDonald's. Can I, can I take your order? My kids were cracking up. <laughs> they were just thought, I was like, Shh, shh, shh. Uh, yes, I will take a, a Big Mac meal number one. Don't judge me. I like this. Amen. And I will take uh, number two and, and uh, oh, okay, sir. <clears throat> okay, sir, would you like, would you like that to be large? Or oh, would you like, <clears throat> or would you like it to be, my kids were going nuts. <laughs> <laughs> said, no, just give me regular, just a regular on the, on the, on the, uh, on the Big Mac, and then on the number two, give me, give me a large, oh, hey, okay, <clears throat> and what would you like to drink about, sir? Uh, well, give me two Cokes. <laughs> And I, I tell you, true story, true story. The boy started in puberty and ended his life in puberty right there in that conversation. Because he said, let me repeat that to you, sir. You would like a Big Mac a combo number one with a medium Coke, and you'd like a number two with a medium Coke. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir, that is right. Your total will be $14. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, wow! <laughs> ah! There's no such thing as a teenager in the Bible. You're either a man or you're a child. You're either in a you're either a woman or you're a child. So listen, let me just let me just buckle up for just a moment and just let's just buckle up and take it for a minute, okay? If you're gonna act like a child, we're gonna what? Treat you like a child. Yeah. Precious. <laughs> By the way, Precious wasn't the one I had a problem with. I wanted to, I didn't want to give Precious a spanking. I want to give her mama a spanking. Well, you know, raising a kid to act like that. But, you know, there ought to be a time in your life when you want to quit being a child yep. sir. and you sir. want to be a man. Amen. You want to be, quit being a child and you want to be a woman of God. Mm. I want you to think about that for just a moment. As we start into some scripture here tonight, I want to talk to you about the difference between cowards and climbers. If you'll turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 14. 1 Samuel, chapter number 14. Mark Batterson, he is not a Baptist, I'm going to disclaimer that. But he wrote a book called All In a number of years ago, and um, I read the book. Uh, I won't say it was deep. I won't say that I had a, a whole lot of significant, powerful things in it. Uh, but what he did say uh, made absolute sense. It's time that we have people who are all in. Yeah, man. All in. He starts out his book, and he talks about a, a missionary, and I've given the example several times of this missionary who, a true story, who took everything that he owned and he put it, or everything he needed, and he put it in a casket. Right. And he and his family moved way out into some Polynesian islands. And he took everything he needed in a casket. Right. He was leaving home. He, he, God had given him a job to do. And he was going to perform that job. Whatever happened. 
When he went to get off of the boat, they say that the captain pleaded with him not to get off the boat and go, that it was deep, dark tribes, and they were not going to be kind to him, that they would likely kill him, to please don't do this. He says, I have to do what God has told me to do. They unloaded that casket, and the, sh and the ship's captain watched him as he took that casket. He and his family carried it into the bush of that island that they were going to to reach these these indigenous people. One by one, his, his family died, and he stayed there and was continual and served the Lord. He was all in for what God had given him to do. Nothing was getting in his way. Many years later, that missionary died and was buried in the same casket he brought with him from England. And to this day, you can go visit in that place, and they have, it, uh, they have, uh, uh, they have placed a, a stone placard in the ground there, a monument, if you would say, over his grave, that says, when he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Mm. I believe in this room today are young people who if you would just allow yourselves to not be a coward, yeah. to not be a child, put off childish things, and set your focus on what God has for you to do, there is a darkened world out there that needs a light, right. and you may be the only light that they'll right. ever see. Right. Now, I look back, this November will be my 30th year in full-time ministry, 30 Amen. years. Amen. 30 years. And I'd like to tell you that those were 30 years of just hundreds and thousands of people coming to Jesus and, and everything was just happy and easy and I, I can't tell you that. But what makes me continue on is when a teenager that was in my youth group when I started this journey 30 years ago, who is now 40 years old, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or 45, uh, maybe, where they find me on social media or something, they say, "Brother, is this the Brother Perry who used to be at Valley Memorial Baptist Church, who used to be at Grace Baptist Tabernacle? And, and I'll say, y yes, it is. They'll say, I don't know if you'll remember me or not, but I'm Christine Milraney. I'm this one, I'm that one. And, and I'll say, J uh, Jenison Owens, yeah, yes, I do remember you very well. Well, Brother Perry, we've not talking in 25 years. We've not talking in 26 years. But I want to let you know that that God allowed what you want. I, I saw some things that you had to go through, and God allowed that to speak into my life. And today, uh, I'm, I'm married to a pastor, or I'm serving in my church as a Sunday Amen. school teacher, or Amen. we're doing this, or we're doing that. Let me tell you something. Those are the things that excite me and say, okay, it is work. What, what we're doing is making a difference in people's lives. I want to tell you a story tonight about a young man named Jonathan in the Bible. And he was not a coward. He was a climber. In Mark Battison's book, he wrote this. He quotes a one-liner from a movie. I don't know the movie. I don't watch a whole lot of movies. But he says in this movie, someone said, Sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. That's not just a great line from a well-written screenplay. It can actually change the plot line of your life. In that school in Pennsylvania, what if just one young man said, no, you're not touching my sister? It could have changed the whole scenario. Have y'all ever heard of a man? Is it Scott Beamer? Is that, is that the name? Uh, uh, Nehemiah, I saw the book on your shelf. Todd. Not that I was being nosy Todd. in your basement. Todd. Scott Beamer. Todd. 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 Thank you. Please. I knew it was Beamer. I couldn't remember the first name. I just buried, listen, to Todd Beamer. It's a young man who um, on 9-11, yeah. most of y'all weren't even born then, were you? Uh, oh. <laughs> I was preaching behind the pulpit of a church. Bell, uh, Emerton, uh, Emerton Baptist Church in Bel Air, Maryland. Brother <coughs> McNeese was the pastor. I was behind the pulpit that morning during a, a jubilee that they were having, a mm -hmm. camp meeting jubilee. They had a Christian school. All the Christian school kids were out there. 
and probably about 150 or 200 preachers from all over the United States would come, and it was my turn to be in the pulpit that morning. And I was in the pulpit preaching when I heard planes fly. It, sound, it felt like it just took the shingles off the top of this octagon church off. And I made, made the place shake. Everybody looked around. We didn't think anything. Then we heard more planes. And it wasn't long till a secretary ran through the back door, so she said, America is under attack. And I looked at the pastor, and I said, what do I do? He said, you keep preaching. And I kept preaching, and that morning the altars were full. After we finished preaching that morning, we rushed out into the pastor's office where he had his uh, monitor, and they pulled it up on the Internet, where we watched live as the Twin Towers fell and plummeted to the ground. And then we saw where they panned over to the Pentagon where it was in flames. And then they panned another screen where we could see fire on the, in a field in Pennsylvania. We were all lost as to what was going on. That night I had to drive from Bel Air, Maryland to um, uh, 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 Pitt, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was trying to think of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, a place called Rainbow, which was near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to preach that next day. And um, as I was on the freeway in Pennsylvania, I passed right past that place, and you could still smell the burning from that plane. And on that plane was a man named Scott Beamer. They believe that plane was going for the White House, I hear. I don't know for sure. But Scott Beamer told his wife on the phone, I don't know the whole story, so I may get some of it wrong. I need to just pull that book off the shelf and read it while I'm there, I guess. But I remember that he got a group of men together, and they decided if this plane was going down, it was going to have to go down over their dead body, that they were going to do something. Wow. And his wife, the last thing that she heard as he was on that cell phone, it's him say to the men, let's roll. And they stormed the pulpit, and there's a strong chance that the White House is standing today. And we don't know how many lives were potentially saved because one man garnished some men together and said, today's the day that we die. But we're not going to go down, cowards. Yeah. We're going to do something. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just about three weeks ago, I buried Scott Beamer, Todd Beamer's Sunday school teacher, who led him to the Lord. They were in Wheaton, Illinois, and a few other places in Illinois, and Indiana is uh, where this family was from. And as a matter of fact, the man that I just, uh, just, uh, uh, just to give you a little bit of history, the man that I just buried, uh, Brother Jack Fisher, uh, his mother and father, when he was a child, they attended. Uh, the uh, church in Hammond, Indiana that was pastored by uh, Jack Hyatt. He led this young man to the Lord. He was not going to be a coward. He was going to be a climber. I want you to very... I want you to listen instinctively tonight. As I said just a moment ago that sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. I want you to think about this. 20 seconds is about how long it took for Peter to step out of the boat. It's about how long it took David to charge Goliath. It's about how long it took Zacchaeus to climb down a sycamore tree. It's about how long it took me to surrender my life to Jesus. It's, uh, it's about how long it took me to surrender to my comfort zone and uh, uh, leave and go to where uh, I am going to be soon. God is looking for climbers and not cowards. 1 Samuel chapter 14, read with me. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison. It is on the other side, but he told not his father. Now his father is Saul the king. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migran, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahai, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not 
that Jonathan was gone. Now, I want you to think about something. Something's got to be done. Yes. The Philistines are coming. They are going to, they are coming whether you want them to or not. They are coming. Jonathan says, I'm going. Saul just goes and sits under a pomegranate tree. Saul was a coward. And Jonathan was a climber. Right. Moving on. It says here, and in between, uh, between the passages uh, uh, by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sena. In the forefront, there was one situate, uh, uh, was situate uh, northward over against Mishmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bears armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. In other words, he's saying we don't need a lot. Yep. As a matter of fact, not by might, nor by power, but by thy spirit, thus saith the Lord. Not by strength, not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit, thus saith the Lord. Uh, think about that for a moment. Oh, looky here what he says, though. It says here, verse number 7, His armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. And if they say unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand in our, still in our place and will not go unto them. But if they say to us, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hands, and this shall be a sign unto us. What they do? They put what we call a fleece before the Lord. They said, what we're going to do, they're way up on that hill. Now, this is a stony hill. How many of y'all like to do mountain climbing? And y'all go to these places where you climb these, these, these walls, you know. We climbed walls when we were kids, but all it took was caffeine. We didn't have to have ropes and stuff. You, know. you just caught that. Okay. Now, people actually pay money to be tied to a rope and... Boogity, 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 up and ring a little bell at the top. I don't understand that. I'm not, listen, if I'm given money for something, there, if, I, if, if I will climb up a wall, there had better be a pizza and a snicker bar at the top. Amen? But they got a little bell. And everybody? I have no desire whatsoever. And especially... When you weigh what I do, 200 and none of your business pounds. <laughs> I don't want some teenager looking at their phone, holding a little rope, and me way up there like that. If, listen, if I go to fall, one of us is going up, one's going up. There, okay? <laughs> that pulley's going to be going. <laughs> I have no idea. Here's Jonathan, and he's looking up, and his armor bearer is with him. And it's stony here and it's stony there and it's stony all the way up in the middle. And they look way up there and there's the garrison. That's the fort. That's where they keep all the weapons. That's where they keep the strong men. That's where that's where the bulk of everything is, is up there in that garrison. They look up there and that armor bearer says, hey, whatever you say, I'm going to follow you. And he says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He says, what we're going to do here is we're going to say that they say, hold on and sit, stay right there, and we're going to come down and meet up with you. That means that we're going to get whooped and we, uh, we ain't going to do this. But if God's going to let us have these men, if they say, come on up unto us, then we're going to go up there and we're going to whoop them. We're going to go up there and, and you know what? We might die doing it. But we are not going to sit under a pomegranate tree singing boo-hoo and talking about getting falling in the lake and hitting my arm. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Precious people. <laughs> no. We're going to go. And we're going to allow God to do something great. Look what he says here. Look at what he says. Keep on reading there with me. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer. 
uh, uh, let me go to the verse 11. And both of them discovered unto the, uh, uh, themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. They're mocking them. He says in verse 12, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me. For the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Now listen. Those up there on the top were mocking them. They were acting like the big boys. Can I tell you something? Big boys fall too. Yeah. You may act like you're somebody here at this camp, but God knows who you are. Amen. You may act like you're a macho. You may act like you're in control. But let me tell you something. You put your pants on the same way I do in the morning. I left from El Paso, Texas to come here. I had to be in Riodosa, uh, New Mexico for my son's wedding. And so I went ahead and drove to El Paso and took a plane from El Paso instead of where I usually would fly out of. And I ended up getting there way early. I'd forgotten there was not a time change like I thought there should be for Texas. I forgot that El Paso was on New Mexico time. So I had a lot of time to spare. And I'm, I'm a history buff. I like to look up and see things. So I knew that we were getting towards Memorial Day. It was a Memorial Day weekend, and I thought, I'm just going to go to the National Cemetery there, and I'm just going to pay some respects to those who have given their life. And I wanted to look up and see you know, who was buried there. And I was surprised to see that a man was buried in that uh, cemetery by the name of uh, Sher uh, Sher uh, Sh Sherman um, now I cannot think of his last name to save my life. I just, uh, and I'll look it up right here because you won't know it anyway, so it doesn't matter, I reckon. But uh, his name, uh, I knew it as soon as I saw it. Uh, Sherman Helmsley. When I saw that name, Sherman Helmsley, surely this is not the same Sherman Helmsley that I grew up watching on television as a child. And I look it up, and sure enough, the movie star Sherman Helmsley was buried there. Now, most of y'all in here, if I say Sherman Helsley, don't, don't know who I'm talking about. But he used to play a man on TV by the name of George Jefferson. There was a TV show on in the 70s called The Jeffersons, and George and Wheezy were their names. And they had a maid, and they lived in a high-rise apartment, and he, had a, uh, he was a dry cleaner. He had, uh, had all these dry cleaners, and he had become a, he was a poor guy, and he ended up becoming a rich man. So, uh, and the theme song was uh, moving on up to the top, uh, to a, a, a sky-rise apartment in the sky, and, and it's talking about him becoming somebody. And on that show, George Jefferson was large, and he was a short man. He was a little scrawny short man. But man, he was something else, and he, he'd walk around, and he'd give out orders, and he'd bark out our orders and different things, and, and I thought, wow, this is crazy, so I went to find his grave, and I was shocked, because usually, in cemeteries, if you're somebody famous, or if you're even, you know, someone of distinction, there's special areas that they put you. His was the very last grave before you get to the garbage cans at the cemetery in El Paso. Now, I won't go through the life of Sherman Helmsley, but as I, it caused me to start looking at some things in his life, and I realized we can pretend all day long. We can act, and we can dramatize, and we can be anybody we want to pretend like we are, and don't we live in a time where everybody wants to pretend like there's someone that they really are not, I, I, let me tell you something. It's high time that we have some young men and some young ladies who just decide to be who God created Amen. you to be. Amen. You will never be happier in your life than to just be who God has created you to be. Right. Amen. Amen. Jonathan was ready to set out in God's purpose. So what happens in this story? Well, God answered his question. If they say, we'll come down to you, we better get out of here. If they say, come up to us, then that means God's going to give us, give us this, this, these Philistines. It says in verse 13, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. Look what he says there. And his armor bearer after him. 
He had to climb on his hands and feet because this was tough walking. This is shards of rock. This is mountain goat country. And they fell before, and it says, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within as it was a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was trembling in the host of the, in the field and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers and also trembled and the earth quaked so it was a very great trembling. What happened? God gave the enemies into the hands of Jonathan. Jonathan was no Samson. <laughs> Jonathan was no mighty, mighty man. I mean, he was strong. But to do it all by himself, just him and that little armor bear, it had to be of God. And I want you to see what it says in verse 423, and then I will give you some points here tonight. So the Lord saved Israel that day. The battle passed over unto Bethlehem. You're tonight going to make a choice. Are you going to be a coward or are you going to be a climber? Tonight we're going to separate men from children. Tonight we're going to separate those young women who are serious about what God has for their life and those that are going to continue to be silly little girls. Dear Heavenly Father, would you just allow tonight for a few moments for your word to penetrate and prick the hearts of all tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonathan, in a moment's whim, changed the plot of this story by obeying and trusting God. In this story, we see Jonathan, the son of Saul, leaving the comforts and security of the 600 mighty men of Saul and started climbing towards the enemy. We also see Saul sitting under a pomegranate tree, wasting time, worrying like a coward. Jonathan. Let us go over, it says about him. Let us pass beyond Saul. The Bible says, Terry, he remained. What are you going to do tonight? Are you going to pass through? Are you going to move on? Or are you just going to tarry and walla in all the past mistakes, all the past failures? Let me, let me just start out by commending you for just a moment this evening. Let me just start by commending you for being here this evening. Amen. I, I, I'm not going to go into everything tonight, but listen, let me just say by you being here tonight and choosing to identify yourself with Bible Baptist tells me that we've got some climbers in here tonight. Amen. 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 We're living in tough days. Amen. People do not like people who are going to take a stand for Jesus. Yeah. And Satan's going to come against us in every possible way he can. I wish for a moment that I had a nickel for every young person that I ever had came through our church uh, that just looked and saw what we had to offer and thought, you know, it's just not the direction I'm wanting to go. And they go on out the door. Let me tell you right. something. Uh, it, it, it truly is easier to be here tonight amongst these believers, but it's still hard because there's going to be uh, those things that are going to happen. You're going to suffer, as the brother just said, you're going to suffer persecution. Just know you are. Just know, and listen, but uh, it's not that they hate you. They hate Christ. Right. And you're just in the way of them getting to Christ and the, the, defiling him and who he is. So I, I believe we've got climbers here tonight, but I don't want you standing idle and being afraid because when we do that, we become like Saul. Right. Let's not just dog, dog Saul all day long. Let's not just talk bad about Saul all the time. I grew up thinking Saul was just the worst man that ever walked the face of the earth. I hated his guts. I thought he was sorry. I thought he was a wimp. I thought he was childish. I didn't think the man was able to do anything. And then when I finally read the Bible, I saw at one time Saul was a pretty awesome yeah. guy. At one time, Saul was a man who listened to God. Amen. At one time, Saul was the one that God sent the prophet to anoint to make that king of Israel. God ain't going to put some fool. God ain't going to put some wimp. God ain't going to uh, put some thug in, in charge of his people. God put the right man in charge. Uh, but at some point in Saul's right life, he got scared. And he got selfish. And he got greedy. Yeah. And he became a coward. <coughs> Let's walk through some of these things here tonight. Jonathan requested this sign. God gave it to him. Peter often took risks in his ministry. 
They didn't always turn out the way that he planned, but the, uh, but the point is that he was always ready to, and willing uh, to take a risk. And that's what we're looking for tonight. Listen, Jonathan didn't have the security of knowing that he was going to leave there without any cuts or bruises. He didn't know if he's going to get whacked in the head. He didn't know if he's going to lose an arm. He didn't know if he's going to lose a leg to a sword. He didn't know, but he knew that God was going to give the Philistines unto him. We like to dog Peter. I like to dog Peter. That guy was a nut. <laughs> if y'all have ever heard me, any y'all heard me preach about Peter? If you haven't, uh, I, I, I often will refer to Peter, and I, I hate to do this, it sounds sacrilegious to do so, but I often will we'll compare him to Barney Fife from the Andy Griffith Show. I mean, I remember the Andy Griffith Show. Yeah, yeah. Barney Fife, you know, he's got that gun, he's always looking for his bullet, and, and then when he's got his bullet in there, he shoots his foot, and you know, you know Barney Fife's always messing there. That's Peter for you. That's Peter. He was always messing to everything up. Well, uh, but Peter was also, we like to dog him, but you know what? One thing we say about Peter is he was always the first one willing to get out there and get the job done. Right. Right. He might have messed up. He might, they may have had to get a hold of him. And, you know, you know these uh, kids, when I was a kid, they didn't put you on a leash, you know. Now, and I, I think it's hilarious, but now they put kids on a leash like a dog. You walk around in the mall with them and stuff, and, you know. I'm just waiting for them to put the little shot calls, you know. I don't know what's next. You know? If this is being videotaped, I do not encourage anyone to do that. But Peter, John didn't step out of the boat. Yeah. James didn't step out of the boat. Judas didn't step out of the boat. Peter stood, stepped out of the boat. Mount of Transfiguration. Everybody else just stood there with the mouth open. <laughs> Peter, well, let's take up, let's take up an offering and let's just make no, 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 they'd be quiet. You need to be quiet. There's Elijah there. You know, you should have fire from heaven. <laughs> There's Moses, you know, plagues. I don't want lies. You know, but Peter's trying to do something. What about when, when he cut that ear of that soldier off? Listen, that, uh, there, if you think for a moment that Peter was trying to cut that feller's ear off, you're crazy. That guy probably looked like Barney Fife with his gun, with that sword, trying to get over and walk that guy's head off, and all he could get was his ear. God put the ear back on. Sometimes I almost wish that he did get his head. I'd love to see Jesus just grab that guy by the head. It's <laughs> 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 pretty cool, I think. I'd have passed out. I'm glad I wasn't there. But he was there. Peter was willing to take action when no one else would dare move. Same was with Jonathan. Jonathan and Peter were both climbers, not cowards. Four things, and if you're writing down, please write these down. This will help you tonight. Four things that distinguish climbers from cowards. Number one, the courage to make a decision. Sometimes it, you just need to make a decision. I don't do well with people who don't know how to make a decision. Yeah. I love my wife with all of my heart. I do. <laughs> you know something's coming when you do something, don't you? I do. I love her. I love her more uh, more than any other woman on the face here. I love my wife. Listen, I, I love my wife. <laughs> I do. Sometimes she can drive me crazy. <laughs> we'll go to a restaurant that we've been to 7,432 times. And it's like she's never seen the menu. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm the kind of guy, when I go to a restaurant and I order something that tastes good, I don't care what else they have on the menu. That's what I'm getting. Amen. Tell me all yeah. what I'm talking yes, about. Sir. Amen. Yeah. I don't need to know what the special of the day is. I don't need to know how good, the, if I've had it, it's good. And now, uh, buddy, buckle up. I know what I want. I'm going to get it. Amen. But my wife will go and she said, oh, I just don't know. I just don't know what I want. I said, honey, I told you we spent this restaurant three hours ago. I know. <laughs> what are you eating? Honey, it doesn't matter what I'm eating. You're going to get what you want. Well, maybe it'll sound good to me. <laughs> what do I always? <laughs> oh, yeah, you can have a little No, I don't want that. We just wasted 45 seconds to learn that! What you want to eat. My wife doesn't enjoy making decisions. 
when we were just married, I don't think I've ever told y'all this, but when we had just married, with this, we were poor. We were poor. We were poorer than Job's turkey. We didn't, have, we, we didn't have no. Job's turkey had a little corn to eat. Amen. We didn't have no corn to eat. Amen. My wife didn't had never eaten a bean in her life. Her, my mother, my, my, my mother-in-law, if she ever gets to see this, I love you, uh, grand, uh, grandmommy. I always uh, joke with uh, my mother-in-law. She wanted my wife to marry another man. She really did. And uh, he ended up robbing a bank. So now she really loves me. I'm really the best son-in-law there ever was. And, uh, but my mother-in-law, she was from Ypsilanti, Michigan, and she cooked like a, 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 a I almost said Yankee, but I don't want Miss Duff to throw something at me. She, 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 she cooks like a Michigander. You know, they'll put fat in anything. It's just, you know, dry and bland and you know they, they, they throw green beans in the pot and they hurry and get them out before they sink you know they want them out no I want them to boil oh y'all say boil I'm sorry boil I want them to boil, boil. Yeah. We, my wife had to learn how to eat beans my wife couldn't make a biscuit she thought biscuits were something she thought you made biscuits by taking the can and going womp womp that's what we call it womp, womp. So, no that's not a biscuit that is a sin, amen. <laughs> you get in there, you get some lard, you get, if, first time she ever made biscuits, boy, it's going to be a long sermon, isn't it? First time she ever made biscuits for me, she, she took the Crisco and she threw it in the flour and she made these biscuits. And, and you ever eaten one of those donuts as a Boston cream or a jelly fill? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. That's about how her biscuit was. It was a biscuit, but it was filled with Crisco in the center. It was like, wow. Oh, <laughs> Why is that? Oh. Oh. No, honey, you're supposed to mix it in. Oh. We threw them outside. She cried for days because the birds would taste them. And the birds would go. <laughs> We were poor, and I remember one time we wanted a milkshake so bad. Oh, we wanted a milkshake. I, I don't know where we are in the sermon. I'm sorry. I'll get there. We, I wanted a milkshake so bad. She wanted a milkshake from Odell's, and uh, Odell's made the best milkshake she ever did have. And we crawled, and we went through our, our seats and cushions in the house. We went around looking in parking lots and picked up nickels and stuff, and we got enough money for two milkshakes. Oh, listen, let me tell you. I still pray that we will have them in the marriage supper. They're wonderful milkshakes. They are good. And we get there. She goes, mm. there's five flavors. <laughs> Pick one! <laughs> what are you having? It doesn't matter what you're having because you're not getting mine. Amen. That's my milkshake. I want my milkshake. You get your milkshake. So I got my peanut butter milkshake. Oh, those are good. And she got her milkshake. I don't know what she had. I really don't care. Because that was her milkshake. This was mine. And we got in the car. Now, I wasn't as mature as I am today. And she reached over. She grabbed my milkshake. She says, I want to taste yours. She went. And I can watch it going. No. And she sat it down. And being the mature, loving, patient husband I am, I rolled the window down and opened it up and I chunked it out the window. And my wife says, well, now you don't have a milkshake. And she drank her milkshake. Now, we've grown past that. I don't throw milkshakes in, at uh, mailboxes anymore. But I, my wife has had to learn through the years to make a decision. I'm picking at her, but we have to make decisions. And you're going to a place in your life, it's time for you to start making some decisions. Listen, you don't go off of this, it was good, we, we, got the, we sing that song all the time, religion, it was good enough for mother, it was good enough for mother, it was good enough for father, and it's good enough for me. No. Whether it's good enough for my mama, it's good enough for my dad or not, don't care. Yeah. Right. Amen. I have to settle that for myself. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If you're born again, it ain't because mama did anything for you. Yep. Yep. Not because daddy did anything for you. I'm not trying to belittle your parents here tonight. But you, it's time for you to make some decisions. Amen. Paul, uh, Jonathan made a decision. 
It says here in verse number one that he said, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. He made a decision. But you know what? So did Saul. Verse two, Saul tarried. The uttermost part of Gibeah. Both men made a decision. If you think for a moment that you're going to uh, uh, wiggle out or that you are going to avoid making a decision, you're sadly wrong. If you choose tonight not to make a decision, you're making a decision. That's right. There's an old say, uh, a story that was told some one time. Brendan Francis once said, some people are very decisive when it comes to avoiding decisions. A reporter once asked a bank president what was the secret of his success. The bank president replied two words. And what are they, said the reporter. Right decisions. Well, how are right decisions made? One word. What is that? Experience. And how do you get experience? Two words. What are they? Wrong decisions. Okay. Listen to the wisdom in that. You're not always going to make the right decision. But being afraid that you're going to make the wrong decision is not the answer. Right. Mm. Making a decision and stepping out, you may realize that one wasn't necessarily the way I needed to go, but you will learn how to make decisions. I had a, a lunch today with a gentleman from your church. We had brunch. And uh, we were talking about how that uh, in business, sometimes people uh, won't, uh, they, they don't want you to make a decision. We, well, we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that. You know what, there's sometimes you can't afford not to do something. Mm -hmm. You've got to be willing to make a decision, the courage to make a decision. Number two, not only do you have to have the courage to make a decision, you need to have the captivation, captivation to choose a direction. You need to have the captivation to choose a direction. Verses 4 through 7 talks to us about how he looked up there between those sharp rocks. He looked up there, and he had to choose a direction. Both of those men had to choose a direction. Jonathan chose to move forward and go up. Saul chose to remain in the safety and comfort of the multitude. Walter Knight told of an old Scottish woman who went from home to home across the countryside selling thread, buttons, and shoestrings. When she came to an unmarked crossroad, she would toss a stick in the air and go in the direction the stick pointed when it landed. One day, however, she was seen tossing a stick up several times. Why do you toss that stick up more than once, someone asked her. Because, the woman replied, it keeps pointing left, and I want to take the road to the right. <laughs> she then dutifully kept throwing the stick into the air until it pointed the way she wanted to go. Many people know the will of God, but refuse to do it yeah. because it's not their will. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a cousin. Well, I was about to say that maybe he'll hear me preaching this one day, and he'll know that I wasn't trying to be unkind, but he would want me to tell this. But then I just remembered that we, we just buried my cousin back in November. He, he was a uh, prison minister, and he had a massive heart attack in the hospital and, and died through a blood clot after surgery. James was buried and had two children, and the Lord called him to Papua New Guinea. And James said, well... If I can just work a little longer and get a little bit more money, then I'll have the money to be able to start deputation with, and then we'll do deputation. And then they got enough money, and then, well, if when I can get these kids a little bit older, because, you know, being on their own deputation, having two little kids is just too much, we, we'll, we'll get, let them get a little bit older, and we'll save up a little bit more money. Well, they found something to spend the money on. And then the kids got older, and then there was another excuse and there's another excuse, but he was always going to go. Yeah. It's just this isn't the right time to go. 
James ended up losing his family, losing his uh, ability to to pastor, and uh, for many years after that, because he had such a desire to lead folks to Christ, he went into prison prison, prison ministry where he could go and share the gospel with somebody. But James would tell me I'd come into town. Or he'd call me and say, where are you at? Said, well, I'm, I'm in Alaska about to preach at a camp. Or I'm in, I'm in, uh, it, it, he would call me and it'd be 2 o'clock in the morning. James, why are you calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning? He said, it's not 2 o'clock in the morning, it's the afternoon. I said, oh, I'm in Israel. What are you doing in Israel? Well, I'm here and I'm helping. You know. And he would ask me, you know, you know, I'm not trying to do a pat on the back. Listen, I'm trying to explain to you some differences when you decide you're going to just let God move in your life and go. And, and James would tell me over and over I wish that I would have just stepped out when God told me to step out. Mm. I wish I would have just done what God told me to do and not put God on my terms, mm. but step out by faith yes, and do what he said. There's no doubt in my mind this evening as I'm looking around that I'm looking at some young men. I truly don't believe that God has quit calling young men to preach. I think that young men have quit answering the call Amen. to preach. Well, I'll put it off. But preacher, you don't know, I, I've been a little rebellious with my mom and dad. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I know some other folks in the Bible that were sort of rebellious with their mom and dad too. Well, preacher, but you just don't know this about me. You don't know that about me. You don't know uh, all these things. Can I tell you, there isn't anyone in here that God cannot use in one way or another. That's right. Amen. Amen. The next time that you feel that God can't use you, I want you to remember this. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. A Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. He's Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha was worried about everything. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. But God used them all. Hey! Are you breathing? God used Lazarus! Don't give me these excuses that God can't use you. Sometimes it's time to be like Todd Beamer. Sometimes it's time to, to be like men of old that I can tell you that just stood out and just said, maybe today's the day that I have to die. But God has given me purpose. God has given me a burning desire in my heart. And I have to answer what God has told me to do. My wife at a youth camp. Sammy Allen in Brasaka, Georgia, used to run a youth camp. My wife went to that youth camp as a teenager. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was her junior year of high school. It was the summer between her 10th and 11th grade year. And she felt overwhelmingly that God was going to allow her to marry a preacher. She'd not ever, never met me. She'd never met such a handsome... <laughs> strong, robust. When I met my wife, I looked at her and I said, there is a young lady who deserves a good man. So I married her before she could find me. <laughs> but that summer, she got on her knees at an altar. Listen to me, young lady. This isn't a sermon about dress codes and standards and getting rulers out and checking things, boxes off. But in an instant, my wife said, Lord, I feel this in my heart. And I don't know if it's right to wear pants or wrong to wear pants or to wear long hair or short hair. She says, but I feel like you want me to set myself aside as an example because you're going to have me marry a preacher and I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. She never met me. Didn't know I was on the face of the earth. And that, from that day forward, my wife, I've been married to my wife for 20 something years. <laughs> 27 years now. Now, this doesn't make my wife a wonderful person. There again, I'm not trying to get off on, on, on standards and stuff tonight, but let me say, I have never seen my wife in a pair of pants, ever. 
Now, my wife doesn't go around scolding women and telling them that they're sinners if they wear pants. My wife doesn't do that. If you wear pants and you come into our home, you will be welcomed and you will be treated very kindly and graciously by my wife. I've never seen my wife in pajama pants. That doesn't make her a great person, but when she made a commitment to be a climber that night, she said, Lord, I don't want to confuse anyone. So I'm going to start now separating myself for someone to do something great for God with. And this isn't a message trying to get every young lady in here to, to, to get up here and to, 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 to have long dresses. Or scr That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say she was willing to separate herself. Yes, sir. No. That's good. And to present not a holier than thou standard, but a standard which God could use before people. Exactly. You have to choose a direction. Not only do you have to be, uh, uh, to have the courage to make a decision and the, and the captivation to choose a direction, oh, but listen, also, you have to be create, uh, have the creativity to make a discovery. In verses 8 through 12, both men made a discovery. Jonathan discovered that God's way doesn't calculate well or make sense, but it is better to do it God's way. Can I tell you, you'll get much more out of it if you do it God's yeah. way. Saul discovered that sitting under the tree and waiting wasn't working out too well. A young student once asked the discoverer of the anesthetic property of chloroform. Sir James Simpson, what he considered was the greatest discovery. He asked Sir J James Simpson what was the greatest discovery, expecting him to say chloroform. The man of science and also the man of God answered, the greatest discovery I ever made was when I discovered that I was a great sinner and that Jesus Christ was a great sinner. Yeah. Nice Some of you need to be bold enough tonight to be a climber and recognize and confess that you need Christ to save. Yeah, right. Some of you are afraid yeah. to do that because you think your friends around you and the adults around you think you're saved and you know you've been playing games this yeah. whole time. I can take you to a lady right now. I just sat in her hospital room <clears> last <throat> week. Her name is Geneva Morris. Geneva Morris is in her, she's 90 years old. As a matter of fact, I brought her to y'all's church many years ago. How many of y'all may have been there when I had an organist with me, and a little old lady, she came and played. Everybody was so impressed that I traveled with my own organist. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Uh, my organist. Miss, Miss, uh, Miss Moore, Mrs. Morris was married to a pastor. And it wasn't until Sister Morris was about 75 years old that she finally quit playing games. Mm. Mm. She was afraid to tell people. Because she was the pastor's wife. Mm. She was as lost as lost could be. But let me tell you something now. Miss Geneva will tell you. Oh, I'm so glad I got past that pride. I'm so glad I got past all that fear and became bold enough to do what was right. Oh, tonight, I wonder if there's some here tonight that need to make a great discovery. And then, last but not least, climbers have the comprehension to choose a dictator. Both men chose a dictator. Jonathan chose faith to dictate his actions, and Saul chose fear to dictate his actions. Are you a climber tonight, or are you a coward? The Philistine army was not defeated that day because Saul was a great king. Sometimes kings get tired. Sometimes kings don't make the right decisions. Sometimes mom and dads get tired. Sometimes mom and dads don't make the right decision. Sometimes we, it's time to stand up and be a climber. Not rebuking, not rebelling against my husband. Well, what I'm saying, I'm saying standing up and bringing that strength through faith. You remember the parable of the talents? Two stepped out by faith and became climbers and they increased their money 
without nothing but faith. The upper other operated out of fear, and he hid his money and never increased it by a single penny. My question to you tonight is, you're going to continue on. That's the thing, continue on. Lord, are you going to continue on as a coward? Let someone else do it. Give you some statistics and I'm done. I'm going back where I'm staying and going to bed. I worked with a man in the ministry by the name of Brother Stephen Sykes. I actually brought Brother Sykes up to the, the camp in Kenai several years ago. Brother Sykes is a church planter in Deming, New Mexico. Deming, New Mexico is a very interesting place. Y'all won't know this name, but the adults in here will. There's a man by the name of Charles Manson many years ago, murderous man, an occultic, satanic man, had a swastika tattooed on his forehead. He was a murderer and uh, had a cult. I don't know that he ever took a life. He talked his cult members into killing people. A lady by the name of Barbara Walters was a, uh, um, she was a news anchor and an interviewer, whatever you call those people, and she was interviewing uh, Charles Mance, uh, uh she was uh, uh, interviewing him. And she asked him, Mr. Manson, if you were to get out of jail today, where would you live? He didn't look up into the heavens. He didn't scratch his face. He didn't, hmm, not at all. He looked her dead in the face and she said, where would you live? And he said, Deming, New Mexico. She said, why Deming, New Mexico? He said, because Satan himself lives in Deming, New Mexico. Now, I have knocked doors all over New Mexico, Texas, Colorado. I've knocked a lot of doors. I've never knocked doors like the ones I've knocked in Deming, New Mexico. There is a spiritual hindrance there like I have not seen in many places. But Brother Sykes is an analyst as well. It's what he did for a living before he surrendered to do this for the Lord. And he has taken his gift as an analyst, and he's gone back and he has researched, and we have uh, several pastors have helped Brother Sykes to research all across the nation. And it started out by looking at counties. Now we've started looking at cities. And what we've done is we've said that, generally speaking, that one pastor can effectively, if he has, if he's just strong and on fire for God, he'll get out there and get the job done. Now, some pastors can do more, but the average man can get to a total population of about 10,000 people a year. In other words, if you've got 10,000 in your town, one man without any staff or anything could effectively reach 10,000 people by taking his people out and drunking on doors and soul winning that he could, he could have a church thrive at 10,000 population. Now, if you've got a population of 100,000, how many churches do you need to effectively reach those people? 10 churches. If you have 200,000 population, you effectively need 20. You understand? And we've identified counties, and you can actually go to the website, B-S-A-L-T, bsalt.org, and you can go state by state and see where they're missing. And according to the analysis, listen, listen to what I'm saying right here. If something major does not change, and if the Lord tarries in 30 years, fundamentalism, Baptistic doctrine, as we teach today, will effectively be erased from most places on the face of the earth. Why? There are more men leaving the pulpits than we can replace them, much less have men to go out and the church plant where they need it as well. Why? It's not that God's quit calling. People have quit climbing. It's easier to sit under a pomegranate tree and talk. I quit going to pastor's fellowships in, in the area where we live. The reason I have is because most of them are just want to go in there and tell you, well, you know, we're just holding on for Jesus. You know, you just can't do it like you used to. And you, the old ways just don't work no more. And no. Laziness sitting behind your computer and eating donuts in your office don't work no more. Amen. And my generation has failed you. Listen to me. Because we've done the work before you. Instead of 
challenging you to get out there and do the work. I'm challenging you to be like Jonathan of the armor bearer. Take God at his promises and decide tonight to be a climber. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, I wonder in our midst.